Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are well into our 29th year, I interview writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished in the past, what they're planning for the future. It's a wider net than that, though, as if you, if you have been watching the show for the last 29 years, you know that occasionally we have other brands of artists on, uh, painters, sculptors, musicians, actors. So if you have an idea for a guest who might be good for the writer's block, whether a writer or other brand of artist, watch for our address at the end of the show. We'd be very happy to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the writer's block is a product of cable access television. All the programs originally produced here at 1623 Studios are a result of cable access television. They're for and about Cape Ann. So don't be tempted by dish. You stick with cable and stick with the writer's block. Tonight, I'm happy to say we do have what for our uh, program is a novelty. We have an artist, a visual artist on by the name of James Chisholm. Uh, he is originally from Winthrop, Massachusetts, attended Revere High School, then Northeastern, and although he's been for many decades an artist, he graduated with a BS degree in industrial relations. That didn't last. He went after that to the Museum of Fine Arts School and studied art and became an accomplished artist, very well known in Boston and the North Shore and nationally because he's had shows in such prominent venues as New York City. I'm going to read as part of further introduction a couple of brief paragraphs from his website and you'll see the website address on the screen. James writes on the website, I paint and draw every day, most of the time outdoors whenever and wherever. Recently, I started doing wood sculpture again based on natural themes. I enjoy the experiences that nature provides during the various seasons of the year and recently installed a show of paintings titled Painting Experiences in Nature at North Shore Community College. I live in Salem. I am married, have three children, the youngest now 36. In my earlier years, I attended Northeastern University in Boston, majoring, as I mentioned, in industrial relations. A few years afterwards, I was accepted to and graduated from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. I graduated later from Mass College of Art with a master's degree of science in art education. His paintings hang in collections at Harvard University's Grossman Library, North Shore Community College, and the Boston Museum of Fine Art. Welcome to the show, Jim Chisholm. Glad to be here, John. I should also add I had the honor of teaching with you at North Shore for many years. That's true. Tell me how you got interested in art and how you got uninterested in industrial relations. Well, while at Northeastern, I had friends that uh, started to tell me about this very interesting school across the way from, from the campus. And so uh, after a period of time, I did go over to the MFA to see shows occasionally, and I had had an interest in doing artwork for many years, but just as sort of a side thing. But I started to uh, have an increased uh, sense of uh, that maybe art was where I wanted to be, painting in particular. So. Uh, they mentioned the school, and I went over and investigated, and I was accepted to their school in 1965. And um, one person at Northeastern was quite helpful, who was a teacher of uh, uh, history of art, named Bob Wells, who had graduated from the museum school, and uh, he wrote a recommendation for me, so that was certainly one of the, you know, the, the start-offs of what I did later. Uh, the school is an interesting school. It wasn't all that expensive at the time, but it was difficult to get accepted to. And I studied with uh, many, uh, you know, really, really full, full blown artists. They were really into the work. They, they, they taught because they loved what they were doing and they wanted to share it. And that kind of impulse stayed with me through, uh, and it still continues to do so through my, my later teaching. And uh, so I had the, uh, the honor of studying with some, uh, 
some great artists, um, one of whom was a man named Jan Cox, who... Um, Ian? Good. J-A-N. J-A-N. Jan, Jan Cox. We, we'd yeah. go, wait, it could be that. You could say it that way, but, but he, he was uh, from uh, Holland, but he lived mostly in Belgium. And uh, he had actually been in the underground in the Second World War, and, uh, but also was a really gifted artist and uh, was very uh, influential, as he had, was to many of the students at that school. And others, uh, Feininger, whose father was at the Bauhaus, and he went there that, to that place. So it was really a strong uh, faculty. But the faculty, uh, again, they were really con concerned about doing art as well as teaching it. And so they had a real you know, connection to, the, to what the, uh, the young people coming the to study was. caught their passion. Yeah, yeah, I caught the, well, yes. They, but, they really, they were on fire with, uh, with that process. And, uh, and it's something I, I often say to my own students who have an interest, that you really have to want to be in this. You have to love this. And if you don't have that love, then it, it, it may not stay with you. And it's a difficult career. You have to really do some, give up a lot of regular, you know, things like nice homes in the country and all that to stay with your art. Yeah, and I, uh, know. <laughs> I know the problems. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's that kind of a thing. So I, I, I continued on, my wife and I, uh, she's been a great help to me over the years. And uh, most recently, um, in uh, 2013, I got accepted to a gallery in New York and, uh, and she came down with a serious illness, but she didn't tell me because she felt that if that she did do so before the show would open, she would, we, I would not go. So she was very- uh, Very helpful. Very, she's very strong I person. I should mention your wife Joanna is in our audience. Yes. We rarely have an audience, but we're very happy to have her oh, she's, in the audience. She's a terrific person, love her dearly. Let me ask you, uh, was there someone in your early life, very early life, who put that sensitivity to art into your head so that it could emerge later? Uh, my father was actually an inventor. Uh, uh, he invented the, uh, the, the, the very beginnings of what is now known as the emergency light system. Uh, those little boxes that sit in restaurants and other places with, that go on during power outages. Yeah. He literally invented it. And uh, he, was all, he went to uh, Northeastern later. He had dropped out of high school in his 10th grade, but then continued on and went to Northeastern and then up to Wentworth. And he, he was studied some math and engineering there. So he, he's got about six or seven, he passed away some years ago, but he's got a number of patents. They're probably still going in, in, uh, in the patent office. But he, he had that kind of a sensibility. He, he, he liked to explore and understand things and so you think uh, that's where that was the source? I think that so. could be a source both for the art and for the yeah, industrial. Yeah, uh, that's true. And, and my my mother was also she was she if she had had the opportunity she would have probably become a poet, but she didn't. But uh, that was another thing. And I understand that in somewhere in the Chisholm uh, legacy there's there's an artist out in Scotland somewhere, uh, buried in one of the burial grounds over there, <laughs> and. Uh, but he was he was an artist in about the 18th century, so I guess it's in the blood. So you got it from you got it from someplace. Yeah, I think so. Because it's it's strong. Oh, it's it's just such a. It's, but I think I think uh, as a, as a poet and as a working artist yourself, in that sense, you know how things have to fall into place in a certain way to make things happen. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that's what seemed to happen. So uh, tell us something now. Our audience is. <clears throat> been curious about the painting that they're seeing on our long shot, our two shot. Uh, can you say something about this painting and maybe talk about its its style and that sort of nature, which we mentioned in the introduction, that yeah. you uh, that you work with? Yeah, the, the um, I, I, while I was at, at museum school, there, there tends to be a, a, an emphasis on abstract, or, you know, new, new, new ways of painting. Or at least to that time frame. And so I had done a series called The Studio uh, Cave. And it was based on the idea that artists uh, are often uh, giving work to, for other places, for buildings and to sell sometimes or to give whatever they do. And, uh, but sometimes it's important for the artist to celebrate the place where the painting comes about. And so... Uh, the actual physical place. Yeah. So... Uh, I had studied with Feininger, and he had one of the projects in muse at the museum school. And one thing he had us do was to do what he called a cave painting. And so we tried to 
understand how the ancient painters wh whose works are in the caves now we can find nowadays uh, might have been thinking about their work. And, um, and so, in a way, the caves are celebrations of the work that they, they did, you know, the, inherently, because they didn't move them too soon. There were too many places around. So, uh, and I, when I got out and I started to work more out in nature and I started to get to a more, <coughs> excuse me, a naturalistic place, I decided to start doing uh, paintings on site. And uh, all of the years after I graduated from the museum school, I stayed at the MFA teaching both adult classes in painting and drawing and uh, studio, uh, I mean, uh, kids, uh, teen classes. So um, in 03, um, I, was, I was teaching in the, uh, the Impressionist Gallery at the MFA with a teen class. And uh, we were gathered around the Degas sculpture, the, the little dancer, the uh, bronze piece in that gallery at the MFA. And so um, uh, a parent came in to see us at work. And so um, later that year, the youngst one of the youngsters was accepted to a very prestigious uh, um, prep school that dealt with art. And as a consequence of that, the parents gave me a wonderful book. And it was a book on... Um, 19th century drawing technique uh, by a man named Giles Bogg. And uh, it was very old school academic drawing. But I looked at it and I said, gee, this is somewhat like I've been doing myself, you know, teaching students to stand away and look carefully at the work and block it out in a certain particular way. And uh, so I said, the thing is that this is a transpositional process. I can take this to other types of uh, media or other views, I should say. So instead of thinking of it as a, as a studio project for a figure or a portrait, I could use that technique outside. And right. I st the technique consists of standing off and blocking out your study from about a six, eight foot distance away and very careful sighting. Um, and so uh, I tried it. I, I want to mention the title of this. Yeah. This is Millbrook too. Yes. The Millbrook is one of the locations you chose to yes, up in stand Boxton. off and, right. and, yes. and examine. So I, I started with a relatively small scale. So, you know, for that kind of, sometimes I, I, people that work with the uh, outside paintings in this particular technique use a small scale, very small, say about 10 by 14 or so. But I, this is, as you can see, a little bit larger. But I blocked out the painting. And while I was at the museum school, I studied with another person who was pretty, he was really big about the still life. And his name was Henry Schwartz. And Henry taught us, uh, how to do the trempe le painting, which is a very tight, very uh, detailed type of an approach. Uh -huh. it, takes a, it takes six months to get a painting done. And so uh, at, using both ideas, I kind of put them together and I started to paint outside as if I were in a studio. Not, I mean, usually it's, the, the term is, you know, a plein air painting, which it is. It, you're, you're out in the air and all that. But Say that again, what's the term? Plein air. Plain air. Plain pl air. Pl oh, right. So the, being out there just really being right in the spot and working in nature. But usually, a painter does not go big on site. It's, it's, tr it's tricky. And the, usually, the, they're used as study vehicles that maybe somebody will bring back to their studio and bring up a scale and do a, a large rendition of it. But I, I decided I was going to finish the paintings out there. And so, uh, and being around the Impressionists and all the great paintings at the Museum of Fine Arts, I started to, by osmosis, gain some ideas. I didn't have a study Impressionism, uh -huh, yeah. but I just, you know, it's a it's a technique that allows you to get, you know, uh, uh, the, the tones down and, and the uh, colors, you know, to vibrate, I think. Uh, are the colors in this painting reflective of the actual colors yeah. in C2, when, en plein air, oh, where, yeah, yeah, where, where you yeah. painted? Yes. So uh, that was the, uh, the, uh, the nucleus. So I, I worked on site, and, and there's a technique that, uh, that, that is used in... in in Henry's class, we used to glaze over with the darker colors over the a given works on a given day and then come back and bring up the colors again and keep working like that until we reached a certain finish. And so uh, it's an old fashioned technique of layered painting. You know, we, you put a dark transparent glaze over a, a dry underpainting and keep working like that. Well, that painting has a lot of that going in it. I mean, I would put a dark tone over this once they're dried to the touch at home. And then come back over to site and work on it until I completed it. 
how, tell me how you, you sh you've showed us and we're seeing yeah. uh, some other paintings right. done with the same ideas and the same general subject material. How, right. do, how do they differ from each other? Well, I think, I mean, as time moved along in this particular sequence, uh, I started to uh, bring up a larger scale. I, I was working with a canvas uh, 40, 40 by 30. 40 by 30 inches. Then up to 50 by 40 outside. What, what size is this? This is about 20, 30, 28 by, 36 by 28, I think. And uh, so that's, that's, that's getting there. It's getting large. But when you get outside with a 50 by 40, it gets really tricky. But some years ago, before the series of, that I mentioned about tonight, tonight I, I did a painting in, um, in Chelsea over at the old Admirals Hill facility that is now a development. Uh, looking at the bridge. I didn't bring that over. But that painting, uh, I started at home with a bunch of canvases. I didn't finish it. I mean, it started at home. But I, I brought it over to the site with a bunch of canvases, and I started to put C-clamps to pull them all together. And it became eight foot wide. <laughs> and uh, so it, and it, instead of putting it to form up a r usual rectangle, I started to let it just breathe and have shapes, different outside shapes all around it. And uh, so that became the the, uh, the Tobin Bridge, and uh, so it it, it was uh, very different, and uh, and it could have probably been more successfully done it quicker if I had done this in the studio. But I was out there fighting away with nature with this huge monster painting, trying to get it done. So I have this interest in in working outside, you know. Ever, particularly in that scale ever since that point. And of course, you, you're, you're being very gracious in not mentioning some of the technical problems like wind. That happened or, a few and, times. <laughs> and, or dust flying onto the <laughs> canvas, uh, or people uh, screaming. and Oh, well, people coming by and thinking that I was making a glider to go over the Mystic Bridge, <laughs> I mean, uh, or the river or whatever it was. And uh, so... When was that? That was about 1988. So uh, it was kind of interesting. I'll say. Yeah. I'll say. Then I did a, another painting, uh, 70 by 50 outside. And I had the I vehicle that I have to put, you know, I'd put the painting on the roof and go over to a, a, a playing field. And I, that was just more regular because it had regular shape dimensions around the edges. But that was a monster style, scale. And I, you, I, was, I was picturing you buying one of those vans that the glass they companies uh, No. Had. But the old station wagons could, could hold, you know, good scale, so that was part of it. But so, uh, so it wasn't new so, to me to go up so, to the scale. So that's, that's, that's the sequence that we've seen yeah. and that this is, this is part of. Yes. Tell, tell me, I want to get to, to education in a minute, but tell me what you're working on right now. Um, I'm working on a painting. It's, it's not that large. It's 40 by 50 of the Byfield um, uh, salt marshes. Oh, another exterior. Yeah, and uh, it's I'm developing the uh, drawing in the studio. I had developed it somewhat on site, but it's really with a large canvas. It's it's hard to get everything coagulated, you know, up there because it's cars whipping by them right on the side of the road, <laughs> and all that. So I um, and, and you know, worry about them somebody coming by who's texting or yeah. something <laughs> and weaving all over the place. <laughs> oh, believe me. So. Uh, so I decided I'd block out the drawing at least and, uh, and make my dis design uh, changes as I needed to to get the composition to pull together on, in, the, in my home studio. And once I get the, the uh, setup blocked out, then I'm going to go back up there and work probably next spring. And, uh, I also wanted to ask, uh, you are a photographer as well. Yeah, I've done some good uh, yeah. Do you do that occasionally for the fun of it or do you consider that another art form, another pictorial art form, and do it as it, seriously as you do an oil. It's in tandem. I, 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 I know very dear friends of mine do use photorealist technique, which requires tight, you know, uh, work with a photograph. And I, I, that's fine. It's, it's, it's real. I like, I like a lot of the results that come out of it. But I, I like the, uh, the adventure of nature. I like to, you know, be out there with and maybe make uh -huh. the mistakes that you know nature might sometimes will maybe cause you know yeah and uh but uh in fact one of the paintings that i have these these black and whites that i when i did last year uh i was in that sequence i, I called in nature's realm i don't know it sound corny about that but i do like 
you know, music, and I, and I like the Vashak, and I said, that sort of what, what I'm doing. I'm in nature's realm, and I'm doing stuff, you know. Do you play music while you paint? Uh, no, I do this. I, I don't, I have a guitar I haven't played in years, but literally, listen, yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah, I, I, um, I've gone through, I, I, Etienne uh, Messiaen, the, uh, the great French uh, composer of the 20th century, I love his work. And there's a painting, an abstract painting at the uh, North Shore's Lynn campus that's based on his, his work. Really? Yeah. So. Uh, I'll have to get down there. I, I know I haven't seen it. It's up on the second floor leading up to the graphic design uh, section. Uh, were uh, you instrumental in getting it there? Yes, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a good pain, good eight foot by five foot. Uh, uh, that, that's a good uh, point to segue to education. You mentioned North Shore. You've taught there for many years, or I taught there for many right. years. Uh, tell me about how you go about. This is a really vague general question. We only we only have uh, uh, not too much time. But how do you go about getting students enthusiastic about art when they are bombarded by social media, by movies, by television, uh, from all sides, and the industry that's bombarding, or industries that are bombarded by, are billion dollar industries using very sophisticated techniques. Oh. But we are in a classroom, and you've got to talk one on 20 and get them motivated. How do you do that successfully with art? I just you know, let them know that if they have, if I want to, you know, do a survey, you might say, to ask each of the students what their particular interests are, whether their interests lay, and what are they willing to go to in terms of developing that. And um, that's the arts, the fine arts, whether it's the writing arts or the uh, theater, theatrical arts or the music, are really difficult, really difficult, you know, areas. And you have to have, be really totally committed to it. But if, if not, there are other possibilities. Uh, when I was at uh, Mass Art, I studied uh, with a woman named Diana Kozenek, and she was a, she was a very, very smart, very brilliant person. And she had uh, kind of pointed out there are, there are four core bases to the, to the studio arts. One is the, uh, uh, the person wants to, to make, a, find, make a living, basically. So that would be the graphic design or the commercial or illustrative art and so forth. The other is uh, psychoanalytical, where a person would go into therapeutic usages of, of, for art purposes. The third would be uh, the, the, the artist who wants to make, uh, you know, hang out, maybe live in the studio and hang out with all the other artists and all of that. The, the, the romantic Paris, right. the, Paris kind of climate? That's right. And nowadays we have the, uh, the art that comes from all over the world, you know, multicultural. And I think it mu much more than when, when I was in school, but certainly was developing then. And the idea that what, what, what an artist will have as an idea frame uh, from another part of the world will be probably different than the American artist in the sense of what, you know, what their training is and their, their whole poise, point of uh, emphasis. And I said, that's beautiful. It makes a lot of sense to have that nice kind of connection. And when I was at Mass Art, there was a kid from, she was actually born in Crete, but she grew up in London. And I'll make this quick. But she, uh, she did a piece uh, based on celebrating all of the arts of the world. And she made this huge box that would be, be, people could crawl into and, and gather inside and hold hands. And uh, so celebrate, you know, the connectedness uh -huh. of all the artists. Uh, it was kind of a crazy thing to do, but it was fun. You must get students who are who have had art classes before, they do. fairly yes. sophisticated and well-trained, and you have students who can't draw a straight line occasionally. And they will tell me that, and uh, say, I, I, I'm going to bet you whatever you want that you're gonna be able to draw by the time you get out of my class, and, uh, and by the end of the semester. And so they get working, and they, this, this exercises that I teach them that gives them the comfort to be able to put marks down on a piece of paper without going into a worry state, you know, but they, they keep working, they keep working, and uh, by, by the semester's end, they seem to have got something going. They get a feeling of accomplishment to oh, yeah. draw a nice picture of a banana and an apple. That's right. And well, it looks like a banana and an yeah, apple. Yeah, well, a design class. I had them work with one of the most abstract of abstract artists, uh, Vasily Kandinsky, and they frankly didn't know what the term abstract meant. 
in the design class. And by the end of the semester, we were all working together on a collaborative piece to make a picture, you know, our interpretation of one of his paintings. And it was really fun. You know, and they enjoyed it, and I certainly did. And uh, this past uh, summer, we had work over to the uh, Rockwell Museum. Uh, the students had produced two pieces that were based on two of the four freedoms that he painted, which is being celebrated this year. And they came out great. These wow. kids really worked. They really worked. And we were able to get things. It was some of the traditional techniques like gridding and so forth. But uh, they pulled it together. And, and you are still teaching at North Shore. Yes. Uh, I probably will go th through this spring and then I'm going to uh, maybe fully retire so I can really get going with some of my work. Are you teaching full <coughs> load? Uh, uh, no, no, just two courses. Two courses. Yeah. I retired from full-time in 17, 2017. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, it's... Uh, I'm noticing, uh, I'm always surprised when it goes so fast. We're almost out of time. Uh, I want to ask you a 20-second question. What's the basic fact of advice you could give somebody who's thinking about being an artist? One, one basic fact of advice. I would say find the core of what you want to do. You just really sit down and study other artists or take courses in drawing or whatever it might be, figure drawing. And go for it. Yeah, and then go for it. And not listen to people say, oh, art, make some money. I know. <laughs> Jim Chisholm, I want to thank you very much for coming down and being on the writer's block. It's been oh. very interesting. Oh. And it's a real treat once in a while to have a non-writer, different world point of view. Thank you. You're welcome. So. I want to thank you and TV Land for being with us on the Writer's Block. If you've learned something about art from Jim Chisholm and how to interpret and teach and understand art and have a successful career if you're after that, then the Writer's Block has done its job. Thanks for being with us, and I hope to see you again next week on the Writer's Block. Good night. <laughs>